e eh, a questo punto penso che siete qua tutti per ascoltare Richard e non tanto me quindi passo la parola direttamente a lui lo speech che terrà è già di Society e eh, niente non da dire vi ringrazio projects aim for digital inclusion. They want everybody to start using computers and the internet. They assume that it's a good thing to use computers and the internet. I don't necessarily agree. Using computing, using the net can be good or bad depending on the social conditions of using that. If we can, if using computing and the net enhances our freedom, then it's good. If it is a tool for restricting us and taking away our human rights, then they are harmful to the world. <clears throat> and thus, I am not necessarily in favor of digital inclusion. I don't necessarily want to be included. If the net is the enemy of freedom, I will take myself out. So we have to ask, what are the conditions that make digital inclusion good instead of bad? What makes for a just digital society? <clears throat> There are several menaces to the freedom of users in a digital society. And I'm going to address them one by one. First, surveillance. Digital technology is a dictator's dream. Digital technology makes it possible to watch everyone in a way that Stalin would have wanted to, but even he couldn't. Even he couldn't have people listening to all the telephones. But with digital technology, that may be a possibility in the future. But we already face extreme extensions of surveillance using digital technology. Sometimes this is done, sometimes you are watched with your own computer. Many programs are spyware and they send information about the user. For instance, Microsoft Windows is spyware. It sends information about certain things users do to a server. We're not sure of what all the information is, we just know some of it. Someone did a study of uh, applications for various mobile platforms and found that a large fraction of them did surveillance. And uh, there is a Facebook like button which I'm told does surveillance of the people who, walk, who look at the pages that the button is in. <clears throat> Now, we can do something about that if we choose software that respects our freedom. But surveillance is also done outside of our computers. For instance, Internet service providers do surveillance. European directives require them to save the information about who talks with whom. And that alone is very dangerous. It would be of great help to any future dictator. Now, when a dictator comes into power, people realize they should take precautions They should hide who they know, especially if they are dissidents. But 
if the dictator has an archive of several years of past information of who knows whom, there's no way to take precautions for in the past. So there's no way people can hide who they know. And that information is extremely useful when the dictator decides to arrest or kill or ruin all the dissidents. And there's also surveillance in the street. In the UK, a system of automatic number plate recognition tracks the motions of all cars. All car travel in the UK is monitored by Big Brother. And this information is extremely useful for crushing opposition to government policies. And the UK has already used it that way to sabotage a demonstration before it could start. You can find references for most of this in Stallman.org in the political notes. <clears throat> so, what we're facing here is the danger of systematic surveillance that sees and records everything about everyone. Of course, if you walk out on the street, somebody might recognize you. And somebody will know that you were at a certain place at a certain time. But this information is diffused. Lots of different people might know something. So to collect this information is a lot of work. And it's only done when it's necessary. Somebody has to think it's really important to collect the information about you, or he won't go to the trouble. But with computerized surveillance, everything can be collected and stored in a concentrated form, ready for use at any moment, which invites the secret police to keep track of everyone and investigate everyone at the slightest excuse. <laughs> National ID cards are a part of censorship, of surveillance, and they're a threat to, to the freedom of citizens. And so it's no surprise that national ID cards are being integrated into systems of surveillance, are being made digital. And this must be regarded as an attack on people's freedom. Really what needs to happen is eliminating national ID cards. There shouldn't be any one kind of ID card that everybody has. Because when there is, that makes it trivial for any activity to start registering people's identity. In the US, there is no national ID card. There is no kind of ID that everyone has. That makes it difficult for any business, for instance, to check the identity of everyone who comes. Because a lot of people won't have whatever it is. So the business, if it wants to keep track of who it has a relationship, will issue its own IDs. And they're not connected with any others. Now this resists the concentration of surveillance information. It's much better if you have 10 different IDs from 10 different organizations or activities than if you have one.